Thank you for joining us today for SNF Agora Conversations, the Politics and Policy of COVID-19. I'm Matthew Kahn, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Economics and Business and the Director of the 21st Century Cities Initiative at Johns Hopkins University. This webcast is produced by the SNF Agora Institute. SNF Agora is a relatively new institute here at Johns Hopkins that examines, and examines challenges to democracy and identifies actionable solutions. They created this new weekly series to offer a social scientific evidence-based approach to exploring the difficult political and policy issues that are arising right now around the pandemic. I'm excited to be part of it, leading today's conversation on the global economic impact of COVID-19. Joining me today are Lisa Cook, a professor of economics and international relations at Michigan State University. Welcome, Lisa. And Kathleen, and Kathleen Day, a lecturer with the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School and the author of The Broken Bargain, Bankers, Bailouts, and the Struggle to Tame Wall Street, a book I just bought. Kathleen, welcome. <laughs> thank you for thank you for having me and thank you for getting the book. <laughs> thank you both for being here. Today, the structure of our talk, our conversation is as follows. Today, the three of us will spend about 30 minutes talking about the economic upheaval the pandemic is causing and the likely effectiveness of new policies that intend to reduce the economic costs we now face. Then we're gonna open it up to your questions. Anytime throughout this conversation. Okie doke. You can submit your questions through the dialogue box which is right next to the video or just below it, depending on your device. Folks, please note that our panelists are not medical experts and we cannot answer any medical questions. Uh, we're economists. Folks, a question for both Kathleen and Lisa. What domestic statistics are a useful thermometer for measuring the challenges that households and firms now face? Lisa, can I start with you? Absolutely. So one of the things that I am looking at is um, the kind of data that we didn't have at the White House when I was there in 2011 and 2012, sort of day by day measures of what's happening in the economy. For example, data from Open Table that tells us how, uh, how the restaurant industry is doing. So I'm looking at whatever's available that will give us real time information uh, about the economy. I'm also, of course, looking at uh, unemployment data. I'm looking at um, uh, UI statistics and looking at business formation data. So the census is making the data available on a weekly basis, which really um, gives us as real time as one can imagine uh, data that we haven't had. Typically, we have it on a monthly or quarterly basis. So this is real time uh, information and it's, um, it's not good. I'll start looking for bankruptcy soon uh, because we know that if there is non-payment and uh, rent and in mortgages, then we'll see that ripple through the economy. But those are some of the data I'm looking at. It's very important. Kathleen, what thermometers are you studying? Well, I, I would second that. There's a lot of, it's going to take a while to sift through this for the macro numbers, but um, first of all, I want to begin with a number that we know persists, and that is that six to seven cents out of every 10 cents spent in the economy, this comes from the Federal Reserve, and it's gone, it's tr been true for decades, comes from rank and file consumers. So you hobble them, you hobble the economy. And then there's things like, uh, there's there's uh, I, I, some economists at the Fed just did a study that a third of uh, renters last month couldn't pay their rent. That's up from 20%, so it's not the 30%. And we can imagine, just common sense will tell you that's gonna go much higher. If people don't have income, mm -hmm. they can't pay. Um, unemployment, certainly unemployment in the depression was up to, in the Great Depression of the 1930s was up to 25% at the height of the Great uh, Recession in 2000, uh, I say 2007, people say 2008 to 2012, uh, was up to 10%. Now estimates are that it's already at 14, 15%. So it's going up very fast. Um, one statistic that should just keep people that should put in context what it means that nearly 17 million people uh, fell into unemployment in the last three weeks alone. So uh, at 14%, we are probably above what we were 
in unemployment. Um, bankruptcies will be the next shoe to drop. That takes a little longer to come in, but the American Bankruptcy Institute estimates that there is going to be a deluge of both personal and business bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, at the international level, what international statistics are, are you tracking to see the challenges we face in the global economy? So um, Matt, it's interesting that you should bring this up. I can tell when I'm in full financial crisis mode when I have nightmares about BIS data because there's <laughs> there's there's some of the worst there's some there's some of the worst to collect, but they're so important to 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 know. Um, so I yeah. of course look at uh, financial data, uh, bank data. I was in charge of the eurozone briefing at the uh, at the White House, so I look at all data related to the eurozone. I look at uh, PMI. Uh, statistics. Um, Remind me what that stands for. Purchasing managers uh, index. So it gives us a sense of uh, what's happening in each sector of manufacturing services uh, on a monthly basis uh, for for all parts of the world, for Europe, for the U.S. Um, I look at um, I look at interest rates um, uh, and yields on bonds on uh, euro bonds. And uh, certainly see how they're how they're tracking. Uh, certainly, this is important right now for the European Union because they're trying to figure out how to collectively uh, provide assistance uh, throughout the European Union. And they're discussing uh, Corona bonds, uh, for example, uh, Europe-wide uh, bonds. And a lot of the old debates are coming back up. So these are the kinds of uh, data that I look at as, as well. But I look at unemployment, I look at the same things that I look at that we are looking at here. Uh, unemployment data, uh, restaurant openings and closings, you can do that with, um, with uh, open table as well, uh, restaurant reservations. And what I also look at is migration data, because certainly during the Euro crisis, there was a lot of movement of young people from the poorer countries in Europe, especially in the Eurozone, to richer countries in the European Union, for instance, to uh, Great Britain. And it's now really interesting because they've not got any place to really go. I mean, if they, they may go to France, they may try to go to Germany, but uh, all of these countries are closing their borders. So it, it's gonna be very interesting to watch. Yeah, can they I might. just say oh, one ahead, thing? I, I just saw a, a, some headlines the other day that really caught my eye and I looked at the report Oxfam in, um, in, based in London is estimating that a half a billion people in the world's population are gonna be pushed into poverty just from coronavirus alone. Now that's on top of obviously right. billions of people who already are in poverty. So. I, again, as, as Linda said, it, we, whatever is happening here is writ large uh, right. around the world. Right. And in, in and my I can own... add just one more thing, since you were talking about the regions, um, follow Africa as well. It's going to go into recession for the first time in 25 years. Wow. And I wrote an article in 19, uh, maybe it was 2002 or so, saying that this is the African century. Right. This is uh, this is what Africa was waiting for: growth rates that were above the rest of the world. And this is the first time it'll be a recession in 25 years. That is very scary. In my work on the international front, I've been interested in the reduction, the silver lining, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions brought about by the economy mm -hmm. slowing down, and the improvement mm -hmm. in air pollution mm -hmm. in China mm -hmm. and India. Mm -hmm. So, in environmental economics, mm -hmm. we're seeing a bunch of silver lining papers yes. to not take yes. away from the crisis here. Right, right. H Kathleen, um, if you were elected president, if you were president right now, what would be your, what policies would you be enacting that perhaps we don't have right now? Well, first of all, I hope I would be elected without the help of Mr. Putin. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, if I were president and, and dealing with this right now, I think a very important thing is to have transparency and accountability. I think it's very troubling that with the stimulus package, the inspector general, the person who's supposed to be policing how the money is spent was fired. That's troubling. What you do not want now is crony capitalism with mm -hmm. uh, taxpayer money being funneled to favorites or political cronies of those in charge. This is very troubling. And this is how you how you ruin a stimulus package 
Uh, there's questions about whether the stimulus package in and of itself is a, is the way to go. Obviously, more money, dropping money out of a helicopter <laughs> is better than no money coming out of a helicopter or coming at all. But what you want are regular payments to people. But if, in fact, you are going to have a stimulus package, it's very important for an obvious many reasons just to make sure the money's going where it's supposed to go. And also for the perception. Excuse me. People do not. If people don't trust the system, and they're increasingly not, you can't have leaders getting on television and making one lie after another every day. So if I if I were president, uh, I would try to have transparency, accountability, accuracy. Facts matter. Facts. There is. There are facts. There are facts, and people need to agree on what they are, or we can't have a conversation. That's what I would do. Lisa, under uh, under your administration, I know that mobile money would be part of the policy. That's what right. would be your suite of policies to, to help us to protect the vulnerable and to get us going again? The first thing I would do would be to direct Treasury to work with the Federal Reserve and with the existing mobile money infrastructure, including payment systems like Zelle, to get cash to people quickly. Because with 10% of the labor force not working. This is going to erode their confidence. And we already know that consumer confidence is at an all-time low. This is, this is historic since records have been kept, certainly for the University of Michigan uh, Consumer Sentiment Survey. So this is, this is what I would do. We have cell phone numbers. We can get all, everybody's cell phone number. We received an emergency alert in October 2018. We can work with FEMA and the FCC. Uh, Treasury can work with those two to, to get this done. And everyone says, well, there's going to be direct deposit, but the checks and other, other payments are going to be going until September. That's unconscionable. People have bills due right now. They have rent due right now. And there's no national moratorium on paying rent. There's no national moratorium on paying mortgages. So we're going to see these rippling through the economy uh, in very, very quick fashion. And the other reason I'm, I'm, supporting mobile money payments is because not only can you receive the money quickly, you can send it quickly. So people will have relatives who won't receive anything. So you can get money to them quickly. We can send it to small businesses to pay uh, for gift cards and so on using mobile money payments. So we can get it to the rest of the economy quickly. And I think we've got to keep them uh, afloat, keep small businesses afloat. So that's, that's one thing. But with respect to small businesses, we really have to maintain and increase this uh, paycheck uh, protection program and, and make sure that it's working well. I know that they're working with Amazon, but it's still too slow. It's still too confusing. It shouldn't have been rolled out in this chaotic fashion. There are a lot of small businesses that are confused. And the thing that I really worry about, where do we get most of the innovation in the economy? We get it from the youngest, newest firms. They're gonna be locked out. It's the older firms that have more access to these SBA loans. They know the process, they have financial advisors. And what we don't want is to kill the innovation that we know fuels the economy. So the, I am really worried if this uh, small business uh, loan program doesn't get off the ground, if it doesn't get a lot more money. So Lisa, let me pick up there with a question for both of you. Um, I was talking by Zoom with my Hopkins Urban Economics students yesterday, and I asked them if their favorite restaurants near campus will survive this crisis. How, if we had a small business entrepreneur on our Zoom broadcast, how would her firm survive this? Are, are folks going to dip into their own cash? Of um, Will any have a strategy to survive or it all depends on government or a, do are any nimble mm -hmm. enough to recover mm -hmm. without government intervention? Uh, I'd be either... Uh... Oh, can I go? I'm going to, I know a couple uh, locally to, to me, one of our favorite restaurants elected to close. Actually, they thought it was in the better interest of their employees because they would get unemployment insurance. I know lawyers who are, uh, where firms are talking about how do we weather this? Do we put people on furlough as young associates? This isn't a restaurant, but it's a small business. A law firm is a small business. Um, and or do we do we have the partners take the hit out of their paychecks, uh, which would would be probably a headline in of itself. But um, so do you do that? How how do you weather this? Who takes the bite? And 
that those are really important questions, but I think people are handling in different ways. I see a lot of innovation in uh, roadside um, ordering in restaurants near me in Washington, DC. I see that you can call. They have many restaurants that didn't have delivery, have delivery with no charge. So there's a lot of ways that it's being handled. But again, I do think that this crisis, while it would have been bad in and of itself, is underscoring and putting a spotlight on cracks that were already in the economy. And part of that is the difference between those who are living check to check and those who are not. And in a restaurant business, which you bring up, it's a good example. Many people employed by that in that sector are living check to check. And when they suddenly don't have income, it really exposes the vulnerability we have in this country. Mm -hmm. And around the world to a shrinking middle class. There, there, there is this growing vulnerable population that was always vulnerable, but isn't just poor, but is the working poor. Suddenly now they're just poor because they don't have a job. So there is innovation, but I, I do think a lot of my local restaurants may go out of business, but if they do stay in business, I think it's because they're in a populated area and they are really reaching out and being very aggressive about offering curbside or home delivery. <laughs> Lisa, did you and, want to follow up there? Yes, absolutely. So 73% of businesses in America are sole proprietorships. So the way they're first going to stay afloat is to get money, like I'm saying, that they, they will probably dig into their own finances to try to keep these businesses uh, afloat. But they're, they're going to be depending on uh, citizen behavior, uh, community organizing. There are several websites that have popped up in different states. For Michigan, it's Save MI Faves, and in California, it's Save My Faves. It's a website that allows you to go to certain businesses and buy their gift cards. Uh, a restaurant in New York is selling bonds. So when you um, when all of this is over, you can go and um, uh, cash the bond, and it's um, I, I think you'd get fifty percent fifty percent increase in the value of the uh, the certificate. So they're just uh, sophisticated gift certificates. But I think there's going to be a lot of organizing around this. I think that I I see. Um, events that they're putting on online, um, but gift card purchases will help. And uh, typically people don't cash uh, gift certificates, so that will help the business. This is just <laughs> uh, free cash. But one thing that will be really important is GoFundMe pages. So this is, uh, this is another part of the crack in the healthcare system. You know, most of the GoFundMe sites are for medical bills, for individuals for med to pay medical debt. And now you see ones popping up for restaurants, for uh, small bookstores, for independent uh, restaurants, for independent bookstores. That's stores. a great example. Yeah. So, so I think that this is a um, this is pointing to the one of the cracks uh, cracks in the system, but that could help small businesses while they await uh, the PPP. Thank you, folks. In our last set of questions, before we pivot to our audience questions. I want to ask some global economic questions, but I, I think it's it's been fascinating what we've been covering so far. Um, if, at, if the U.S. Federal Reserve has achieved great power in recent years, uh, what do we need a coordination between the Bank of China, the Federal Reserve? How could these these monetary leaders work together? It, will we see global cooperation to help to jumpstart our economy? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, we already have. Um, the swap lines that were implemented late in the crisis in 20, 2012 or so, 2011, 2012, we've, we've seen a lot of the coordination that happened in the global financial crisis and recession. And I'll take that period 2009 to 2012. We've seen it happen in a matter of weeks, right? So we have seen uh, coordination across uh, central banks. And uh, so these dollar swap lines are to make sure that there is dollar funding for uh, banks in, in and around, uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Lisa, uh, but, walk me through that. I was not a good macroeconomic student. Does, okay, sure, are, is, sure. it, it, is the nation of China sending us cash? Who, 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 is, who is injecting the capital? Uh, we are. The Federal Reserve is. And uh, ah. making sure that there is dollar uh, availability and uh, in money markets, for example, 
that uh, that these uh, short term loans that are typically done in dollars. Um, if there is bankruptcy, for example, illiquidity in the system, they need this kind of uh, short term dollar funding and they need it quickly. So uh, this was under stress uh, during the uh, euro crisis and it is under stress now. And the Federal Reserve acted really quickly to coordinate with all of these central banks to make sure that money was flowing. Lisa, I have a question I have. Um, that, that is fascinating. Um, I, I, that's interesting, really interesting. But do you, do, oh, I, for both of you do, you, do you agree though that the tools that the central bank has have been under, uh, they've been, there's been questions for, for years well before this coming out of the last crisis, how, just how much the central banks can do. That's, those are uh, funding mechanisms and those right, are very important, right. but right. We're, we're at zero inflation. We're going to go negative. I think there's a question what can be done by the Fed. In some ways, the pet, Fed has a mass more power, but it's, a, it's ability to really affect change in the, in the economy has been lessened. And so mm -hmm. I do think that we need to look to other things. I think that, Lisa, you're, 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 you're the mobile money mechanism is in some ways more important than than lowering interest rate <laughs> tools mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. and so I wonder what you guys think of the Fed's power. Is it they have it, but is it does it mean anything? So, so Lisa, something that interests me, since I I don't know the answer to Kathleen's question, is the coordination. I, I have, can I quickly answer your question? Oh, I can. I can. I'll, I can I'll, I'll let you in in one second. Okay, but sure. What interests me is whether the Fed. W w Many investors now know that we don't know what's going to happen next. Can the Fed it, it, use its power to coordinate economic activity, mm -hmm. it, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy of coordinating expectations? Of uh, mm -hmm. Are some mm -hmm. investors sitting on the mm -hmm. sideline delaying mm -hmm. investment because, um, mm -hmm. because they're uncertain about what everyone else is doing? Uh, mm -hmm. And so... Mm -hmm. of course. Whether the Fed can solve this chicken and egg issue interests me. Lisa, please continue. So, so uh, that's a that's a really good question. Both really good questions. Um, I will start with uh, with yours, Kathleen, because it's I think it's a fairly uh, for me it's a fairly straightforward answer. Congress has ceded its responsibility to the central bank, and it and I would say this is highly unusual, and it's got to stop. Jay Powell was saying this yesterday. Chair Powell was saying this yesterday in his webinar at Brookings that they've done so much of what they can do. Spending, taxing and spending is the purview of Congress and they're not doing it. They haven't done it. So, so they're, they're stepping into the gap, but the, the more Congress is allowing this, the more um, they're giving up independence. They, they are uh, handing more independence, um, more undemocratic behavior over to the central bank. Absolutely. So, you know, no one can complain if, if the central bank is keeping everybody afloat, if uh, the Federal Reserve is keeping everybody afloat, if you want something else. And, and fiscal policy has to be an important part of this. They can't, they can't do everything. But right. they've really acted extremely quickly. So I, I think that they're doing the right thing. But, you know, they're, they're being creative. And I'm asking the Treasury Department to be creative and to catch up and move into the 21st century. And as I tweeted earlier today, every Friday should be Cash App Friday until all of the direct payments are, are made. This is Folks, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that we can't do this. Ca Canada set up its website for uh, payments on Monday. They were paying people by Wednesday. Yep, they yeah, were. Folks, they, they, folks they, I need they, to they, jump they in. Turn around. Yeah. Yes, you're right. You are right. So be before we jump into our listeners' questions, uh, two more global economic impact questions. First, I want to ask about the role of the IMF here. I gave a lecture at the IMF last summer, and the IMF economists were very interested in uh, climate change as a major shock uh, and thinking about mm -hmm. this interplay mm -hmm. between uh, between unexpected shocks uh, and monetary policy and capital flows. Mm -hmm. What role can the IMF now play to stabilize the global economy? Well, Kathleen, do you want to meeting or... next week virtually <laughs> with the World mm -hmm. Bank? So mm -hmm. again, I they're the lender of last resort. They're sort of the world central bank in a, in a mm -hmm. way. We'll we'll see what they can do. But I do think when it comes to climate change, I read 
uh, and I hope that this is true, that a silver lining from this pandemic is it may make people understand that mother nature is not happy. And mm -hmm. uh, I saw something from BlackRock. This is coming from front and center Wall Street. You can't get more Wall Street than than that, where where people are saying this is going to be a this pandemic is going to change people's thinking about climate change. What I think that will do is help the IMF, the World Bank, the Fed, everyone else do what they need to do. But I think what we have to do is we have to get everyone rowing in the same direction. This, this nonsense, this assault on science and what we know to be true, this existential threat in the climate of climate change, we need to just stop that malarkey and, and start dealing with it. And there is some indication that if there's a silver lining to this pandemic, it may help people do that. Lisa, the, the IMF's role in Africa and other key continents that are suffering? So we're certainly going to have to think about the bigger role that the IMF is going to have to play. There's been unprecedented demand. 50, I'm sorry, 90 countries have requested aid. They don't have that kind of funding. We're really going to have to figure out how we're going to be able to support the IMF in this, in this coordinating role. And its its goal is to make sure that a financial crisis that happens in one country doesn't spread to others, that uh, that there is financial stability, there, there is uh, banking stability and, uh, and economic stability. So they're going to need a lot more uh, help. There's going to have to be a lot more coordination and a lot more coordination with the World Bank. There's also going to be a conversation about debt and and uh, debt forgiveness. I mean, we we just got out of this cycle, you know, a decade ago. But it's 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 going to creep back up because bilateral, especially bilateral loans, and especially with China, have um, have crept up, and we've been concerned about this. But we've got to think carefully about how that's going to happen. And if I can just say something about what Kathleen was saying, I think there's going to be a deeper conversation and an answer to your question too, Matt. There's going to be a deeper conversation about global public goods. It, yes. So it may be climate change, it may be healthcare infrastructure, but there's going to be a much needed conversation about public goods because clearly we haven't been investing in them and they're much needed. Let's hope. That's a key so. point. <laughs> Kathleen, a, a, my final question and our listeners are also asking the same question. Um, given the disruption to global supply chains, uh, we, we, it, is a possible silver lining here a revitalization of U.S. manufacturing? Yeah. Well, it, interestingly, what people don't realize is U.S. manufacturing is a has always been a bright spot in our economy. Now, jobs have been lost there, but innovation there is alive and well. And mm -hmm. we have led the world in innovate, or we have been at least abreast with others in mm -hmm. innovation in manufacturing. But yes, I think that when you look at so, where do we get some of our ingredients for our uh, prescription drugs? Where do we have them made in India? Other places? Will that come home? Maybe people uh, before this. Apple was looking uh, because of Trump's war with China uh, and interruptions with supplies. Uh, the head of Apple was saying, hey, maybe we should have our supplies for our iPhones, not just in China. China could be a bit of a loser in this and domestic mm -hmm. manufacturing a gainer if people think, well, we need to have a way in an emergency such as this pandemic to make things at home. Much as we manufactured tanks through the automakers <laughs> in World Wars, mm -hmm. so that we, d I think there will be that. There will be that uh, conversation about how do you have more diversification in the supply chain in a for a variety of industries. Mm -hmm. Lisa, on that point, could Michigan have a significant rejuvenation of manufacturing? Absolutely, the <laughs> country. The country calls on Michigan every time there is uh, some. Uh, emergency yeah. manufacturing to be done. So uh, B-52s at Willow Run Airport, for example, and during the Great Recession, there was this very flexible changeover in what the auto parts manufacturers made. They started making, because they didn't have business from the auto industry, they started making parts for uh, planes and for buses. Right? So they, they actually had demand for those. Those are, are big orders coming from 
uh, state and local governments, uh, from the federal government abroad. So they're very flexible. So I think we could see uh, a renaissance, but I think Kathleen is right. You know, the U.S. is ready to pick up whenever there is a problem like this. This happened during the global recession. I remember at the White House, everybody wanted to be the tech sector that was bringing us out of the recession. And every single day, every day there was uh, data from the industrial production, I went around and showed it to my fellow economists. Good, it's true. We are pretty good at manufacturing, but a lot, it's kind of a well-kept yeah. secret. <laughs> Folks, I, I, I'm, I'm reading several very interesting questions with a common theme. And uh, folks are asking, we know that there continues to be significant global poverty of, uh, and I, several of the questions that are being posed is whether the, is related that an, un, an unintended consequence of shutting down the world economy, how much will this exacerbate poverty? And, and, and how are government officials wrestling with this trade-off of, of the importance uh, Will poverty in the developing world be significantly increased because of our economic coma, as Paul Krugman calls it? And how does that worry affect how we think about policy right now? Lisa, um, I know you touched on this, but I again, I just want to go back to what I mentioned earlier. Someone's put a number on it, and that's Oxfam. Of course, the numbers are going to be a long time coming to be 100% accurate, mm -hmm. but uh, they are they are estimating that a half a billion people, which I think, let me just look at my, uh, I had to write this down. There's so many numbers mm -hmm. floating around. Six to 8% of the world population in a, an additional number of people, equal to mm -hmm. about six to eight percent of the world population, will be pushed into poverty because of this. On the other hand, you have to weigh it with if if you don't if you don't do what we're doing to try to stem the pandemic, you have to weigh these things. But it is having this economic consequence. Mm -hmm. And and one thing I would I would bring up is that this is going to have heterogeneous effects. So the poverty I think is going to be concentrated in urban areas because just as was the case in the Soviet Union, just as was the case in India when everybody was told to go home, people often have in developing countries, the home place, right? They have a place to go, the dacha in, um, in Russia or in the former Soviet Union where they staved off hunger. This is, this is one thing that was a poverty uh, fighter and they will just go and uh, grow their own, uh, grow their own vegetables, grow their own fruits. And uh, you know, what will emerge is not a market economy, but a barter economy because people will be trading agricultural goods, uh, the things they can grow. So I, I think we have to be careful about um, moving the economy more to uh, agriculture. I mean, something that's a hallmark of developing countries, but that may be one of the biggest uh, poverty fighters that, that emerges. A victory garden. And, and what's very interesting about Lisa's point is that much of the developing world has gained income by urbanizing. And, mm -hmm. and you're right mm -hmm. that there's many lessons mm -hmm. from economic history mm -hmm. of, of, of moving back to the farms to make sure mm -hmm. that there's food, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Folks, another question coming through is talking about the challenges in, in South America. Uh, do any continents, I, I, I realize, I know you are experts. I, I've been to South America twice. Um, mm -hmm. Any expertise in other continents and special challenges they face? So I have a question here about Latin America. And that's, um, has that been on your radar screen or are the challenges roughly the same in every, in every continent? I, I, I would say something about um, Brazil. Uh, certainly, certainly, it's one of the largest uh, economies. It's a brick economy, like a large emerging market, really important economy in South America. And I think that it is it is not prepared. And given the uh, Bolsonaro's um, uh, words, <laughs> what he's saying, I think this is actually endangering the population of Brazil. I mean, I'm not sure if you heard, but uh, people were receiving text messages from gangs to shelter in place. And if they were, and, and everybody was uh, stunned, but they were giving the advice that we are giving to shelter in place, to stay off the streets and shelter in place because you can't believe what the government is saying. 
So I think that um, if there are other governments uh, like this, they're going to be, the population is going to be in trouble. Now we have a stronger uh, system of federalism. We have uh, states that are in charge. So if, uh, if what's coming uh, from the center isn't specific enough, or isn't fitting a particular state, uh, the, state uh, the state government um, can step up. And uh, this is, uh, you know, there's a, a local solution to uh, such a problem, but there are vulnerable populations in so many parts of Latin America, they, they have to be paid attention to. Kathleen? No, I, I, I agree with everything you just said, I, but I do think we can see it here when there's misinformation, out and out lies from the federal government, it is corrosive. It's corrosive to democracy. It's cor it's, it has an immediate corrosiveness. We're not having gang members tweet now, but that's, it's, that's just a, a, a microcosm of what's going on anywhere where you have a somewhat dysfunctional federal government, which is laid to the table, uh, disses science and is not looking at the facts and is saying things that are out and out wrong. It has sure. increased the number of people who will get sick and it will increase the number of people who will die. Now, certainly there were going to be many, many thousands, millions of people who were going to get sick and were going to die, but many more because of this disinformation, lying, ig ignorance, um, ignoring of the truth. And Brazil is a if uh, that's a that's a really great example with gang members tweeting. I did not know that. That's that's uh, so, frightening. So I want to come back to something Lisa talked about before. <laughs> and um, in all of my research, I'm always looking for silver linings. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in a point that Lisa made before, we were talking about. Uh, that the world has learned a tough lesson about the importance of collective action and working together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so going forward, will there be momentum at the United Nations of, of how, what will it take for, uh, in a world where we have very large nations and smaller nations, will we mm -hmm. see greater cooperation between nations because of this sobering experience uh, of, of, of that we now recognize, is it true that we now recognize the need for collective action on economic and social issues, on global issues? I, I would say yes. You know, something that my European friends have always brought up is that because World War II did not happen on American soil, we don't have the same view of the social safety net that, that you know, there wasn't this experience of, of hunger, of being under siege. And that's why, this, this is their argument, that that's why they participate more in uh, global pub public goods or regional public goods. Um, they're the most generous uh, suppliers of overseas uh, aid. So, uh, so I think that this is where they say this uh, comes from and where the safety net comes from. I think that there is going to be this, uh, this moment of, of empathy with people that we have never empathized with before. I mean, sometimes you see these, these viruses that break out, let's say Ebola. Um, we, we thought about this as being something that was happening in, in Africa, and this is you know, really bad happening in Africa. It may hit us a little bit with a few cases, but it's gonna stay contained. And I think that's how we think about it. And we don't have uh, generally uh, empathetic statements or thoughts uh, about the rest of the world. And every time I post to my students, I don't know if this happens to, to you all, but I will say, so if you're gonna cut the budget, where are you gonna start? And it used to be, and the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, it used to be the aid budget, the, the development aid budget, the overseas aid budget. And what we know is that this is tiny, tiny in comparison to defense, in comparison to uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And now I would say that many more young people know that this is tiny. Uh, they often believe that it needs to grow, uh, but I think there's going to be much more collective action that, that results from this pandemic. Yeah, I I, uh, I hope that you are both right that there will be, but I um, am worried that it, there won't be. I think that the disunity, what's going on in Europe now with Brexit and with uh, nations becoming very totalitarian, I I worry that 
I hope you're right, but I worry that it it's not right, that it won't happen, that people will forget. People don't never underestimate people's ability not to not to work together. I I think of something that uh, the former Federal Reserve Board Chairman Ben Bernanke said. He said that one thing he learned as a school board member in New Jersey is that two of the most important uh, thing, two most important principles for or ideas for parents is that they want the best education from their for their kids, but the lowest tax as possible. Now those two things are contradictory, and it's a great uh, it's a great specific example of how people are generally they want a certain goal very much, but they're not always willing to do what they personally need to do to get there. So you know, we need infrastructure. Has that happened? That's that we could create, we could solve so many problems if we addressed our infrastructure problem of climate change and we're not doing it. And so will this help? I hope. Folks, my final question uh, is what from one of my favorite students and I'm glad she's listening. Uh, she, my student and I both want to know, uh, Will we see globalization come back, or is 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 this event a, a scarring event that will permanently change our global trade of busy airlines, tourists in every city? Has has international commerce changed going forward? And, uh, and, uh, is there a brief, Lisa? Do you have a brief answer to that in your crystal ball? I I, I do. So maybe I am a hopeless uh, optimist, but. I, I think there will be, again, because I think that there will be more empathy for people who live in other places and might be subject to an exogenous event. There's not of their own doing, but something that just happens to, to people everywhere. I think that there will be uh, more thoughts about uh, greater integration, greater cooperation with respect to trade. Uh, I think that we, let me let me leave it there because that's not going to be what my other explanation was not going to be short. <laughs> <laughs> Can't leave the final word. Well, I again, I hope Lisa's right. I, I I would like to be an optimist, but I'm afraid that some people will use what's going on as an excuse to uh, raise fears about different people in different countries and different economies. Uh, I, I, I hope that people understand that we are all in this together, that e economics and flus, uh, 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 viruses and economics don't respect borders. And so we are all in this together. But, but on the same time, perhaps some of the people that said there was too much globalization, perhaps we need to bring stuff back home and different countries need to bring some stuff back home. That doesn't mean we're not all in this together. But I, I, I'm hoping people rise to the occasion as you guys are either suggesting or predicting. I, I hope that's true. I'm, I'm skeptical, <laughs> unfortunately. Folks, thank you. This has been great. Lisa and Kathleen, I want to thank you for being here today. And thanks to our audience for watching and for sending in great questions. Please join us again next Friday when we'll be discussing COVID-19 and the ethics of scarce re resource planning. Our guests will be Ruth Faden, founder of the Berman Institute and the Philip Franklin Wagley Professor of Biomedical Ethics, Alan Kachalia, Senior Vice President for Patient Safety and Quality at Johns Hopkins Medicine, and Jeff Kahn, the Andreas Dronikopoulos Director of the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. I want to thank, I also want to mention that a recording of today's webcast will be available later today at snfagora.jhu.edu. I hope to see you again next week. Nice to meet you, Lisa. And, and you too, Matt, although you and I work together. Thank you. <laughs>